Yes. Yes. This braid up there, on the picture taken by the probe Voyager, as it reached the end, the edge of our solar system, is our home, the Earth. On it, everyone you love, everyone you know, everyone who ever was. Now let's take a few seconds to try to grasp the sum of joy, the sum of suffering, the sum of hope, the sum of despair, the sum of misunderstanding, but also the sum of potential that lays within it, within all of us. The challenges that face our species, our ecosystem, from political crisis to large-scale hunger to endangered species and climate change are all callies calling for a better version of us. As I graduated from the University of Liège as an aeronautic engineer six years ago now, I believe that our species was craving for something more, more than just further technological development. We had the resources, we had the technology, what was missing was a shift in mindset. For this, what we need is a shift in perspective. If we look back, what we see is this little bright dot, and this perspective shift allows us to embrace how special, how fragile, how beautiful it is. Fortunately for us, we humans, are on the verge of a profound perspective shift. A deep and well-needed problem shift awaits as we are at the edge of finding life elsewhere in the next generation. And right here lays the goal of this talk. Not to talk about the scientific details, but rather to provide you with a break in your day-to-day -day routine so you can step back and contemplate where we're at where we at as a species, where we at as the dominant conscious being on this oasis floating through space. In order to safeguard the Earth, our home, we are going to have to learn to work as one human family. And I do hope, I believe, that these types of paradigm shift, perspective changes, will help us move toward this place. The password will be upon us. Now, this game-changing paradigm shift that are within reach tackled key questions that we've been asking ourselves for millennia. Being conscious, we're looking for purpose. Why are we here? We turn to others, are we alone, to try to find answers to these questions. Interestingly enough, when we think about this fundamental question, we picture ourselves, our friends, our families looking at the stars. And this might be from there that an answer to this question comes. When you look at the sky, if you're not in the cities, you will see millions of stars, actually billions of them. Our galaxy, the Milky Way, counts over 200 billion of stars. Now think about ours, the Sun. It has produced eight planets. So why would the other not produce planets as well? And how about one of these harboring life, a biosphere, as the Earth does. Now, you may ask, okay, great, but what's the point? There are so far we won't be able to go there, true. Yet, I believe we can still get a lot out of this. I believe that thanks to this new vantage point, we can look back at us and reflect and grow. Grow hopefully faster than what we would do if we had to wait to go there, if ever we managed to not <laughs> destroy ourselves um, in the past to them. Now, the field that search for planets around other stars, study them, is called exoplanetary science. So science that study exoplanets, planets around other stars. And I'll show you how it has already started to change our perspective on planetary system on planets. And I want you to keep in mind that I hope that this field will help us change our perspective on habitats, on life, and hopefully on intelligence. For centuries, our perspective on planets, planet formation, planet evolution, has been based on one unique sample, the solar system. Everything we've known or projected related to observation of this beautiful piece. 
Now, what is the issue with that? Well, the issue is that it's exactly the same thing as what you would be bothered by if you were to try to predict the outcome of political election by asking opinions to a member of one family. Different individuals, different planets, yet the same story. The same values change, the same evolution. And as we started to find planets around other stars than our Sun, then we started to be challenged. Then our perspective progressively broadened. We find new planet types. Hot Jupiter, for example. Planets of the size of Jupiter, but that do not orbit the star in 11 years, like Jupiter does around the Sun, but in only in a couple of days. Meaning that the temperature they are roasted by the star, the temperature like, reach thousands of degrees. We find planets without star, literally free-floating in the galaxy. We found planets with multiple stars, like Kepler-16b, that has two stars, and offer this iconic double sunset as Tatooine in Star Wars does. Among the exotic planets found, we found J1406b, that has 37 rings, about 200 times the extent of Saturn rings, meaning that if Saturn in our system had such rings, you'll be able to see it by naked eye in the sky, and it would be larger than the moon. We found planets literally dying around the star as we speak, being pulled apart by the gravitational field. That is how much diversity we've already found in only 20 years, with most, in most of the time facilities that were not even designed to do this kind of science. So think about what's to come. How have we found these planets? These planets are small, very close to something extremely bright and far away, meaning that from our point of view, all of the light coming from the system is coming from a one tiny drop dot of light. Mm -hmm. An analogy would be to try and to study a firefly right next to your lighthouse from a thousands of kilometers away with binocular. Good luck with that. So one way to do this is to use a technique that's called trans transit technique. We search for this drop of light where something is passing in front of the star, the star being the main source of light. The larger the area of the star being blocked, the deeper the flux drop. The larger the planet, the larger the flux drop, the easier these are to be detected. The smaller the star, the larger the flux drop, you got the point. So the flux drop direct is directly related to the area ratio planet to star. Now what is great with this technique is that when a planet is in front of its star, a tiny fraction of the stellar light is going through the planet atmosphere, allowing you to study it. And what is happening then is about the same thing as what is happening when you're pouring a liquid in your glass and your brain is looking at it, while well, your eye, <laughs> your brain is processing. Depending on what is in the glass, water, lemon juice, wine, or beer, Trappist beer, I guess, you will be able to pick or process and understand what is in this glass and what is affecting the light. It is exactly the same thing that's happening that we're using, the technique we're using, to study planetary atmosphere. Now, are all planets of interest in the context of searching for signs of habitability, signs of life? No. What we're looking for are Earth-sized planets, we Earth-centric, temperated planets, meaning that they are not too warm, not too cold, they are quite cozy. They are what we call potentially habitable. They may have liquid water at their surface. And we want them to be amenable for atmospheric studies, meaning that we can actually search for signatures of habitability or signatures of life. Having a planet that's Earth-sized, temperate, but on the other side of the galaxy, meaning that we can study it, is not really of interest for us at this stage. Finding small planets Earth-sized, we've been able to do it. It was tricky, but we got there. Earth-sized and temperate, we've done it as well. And then for a little while, at least on my side, there's been this stress about the fact that maybe we actually wouldn't be able to find the one that are temperate, Earth-sized, and amenable, the one that have this winning combination. And as you know now, I transitioned to astronomy because I really wanted to play with this one, develop the technique to study them, and I was stuck with the big, hot one that clearly have nothing to do with something habitable. We knew we would have the facilities, such as the James Webb Space Telescope, to be launched by NASA and ESA at the end of 2018. Facility actually designed 
to search for by a signature in the atmosphere of exoplanets. So I kind of stressed out. I actually thought for a little while that I might have to leave the field if we didn't stumble on this planet. But then, about a year and a half ago, everything's changed. I got a phone call by Michael Ginon, who works here at the Université de Liège, and he told me that that's it. We got them. Thanks to the TRAPPIST telescope, which was built by the Université de Liège in uh, Chile, it is a prototype telescope, pretty successful one, by the way. <laughs> he and his team, together with Emmanuel Jean, had found the planets that we were looking for, the targets to start searching for signs of habitability and signs of life. The planets were found around a star now called TRAPPIST-1. And what makes them so special is the fact that the star is really not like our Sun. It is way smaller, way cooler. It's actually called an ultra-cool dwarf star. It is 10 times smaller than our Sun, meaning that its area is 100 times smaller than our Sun. So the signal of, pl of planet in front of it is 100 times larger than what it would be in front of the Sun. Meaning the TRAPPIST-1 planets, even though they are tiny, Earth-sized, we can easily study them. We didn't find one planet, or two, or three. We directly moved from having zero target to search for signs of habitability and signs of life to seven. Yeah, oofty, that's right. <laughs> Seven temperate Earth-sized planets, that's it, with a prototype telescope. <sighs> so, what do we know about this planet? What you see here is an illustration. At this stage, we really know little, actually close to nothing. We know their sizes, we know their masses, and we have an idea of the temperature where the temperature range where they may lay. So we do know that for all of them, they might be spots at the surface where they can harbor liquid water. So they might be locally habitable. That's it. So the best really is yet to come. Two reasons. First, because this was detected thanks to your prototype. <laughs> the team is now scaling up through the Speculos project, building an observatory in the, north, in the southern hemisphere. And we try, try, we're now trying to raise funds to build um, in the northern hemisphere as well. With these facilities, Speculos, we will be able, potentially, to find five to ten other systems like this. A large pool of planets to search for signs of life. Second, as I said, we know little to nothing about the planet, but we have upcoming facilities that will allow us to dive into the atmosphere, find out what they are made of, if there is signs of habitability or signs of life. And all of this will happen within the next 10 to 25 years. So obviously, that got the world excited. Right after the press conference we gave in Washington, D.C., this news was front page of most of the world's media's outlets. Over three billion people got affected by the news. Half the world, oh well, close to half the world's population. Great. But we wanted more than just having people sh receiving the news. All of us here on a day-to-day -day basis receive a massive amount of news. The metrics that really matter to us is how people got engaged. And what you can see on this Google trend right here is that there is a massive peak of interest worldwide towards the idea, the concept of exoplanets. It means that for about a week, the world started to look beyond their day-to-day -day horizon, bringing their point of view to worlds well beyond the edge of our system. And this is what I envision for a field. I do envision exoplanetary science as a way to provide humanity with perspective on other planets, new vantage point. Vantage point that we can use to look back at us. Look back at us and try to remember on a day-to-day -day basis, not just every couple of years, on a day-to-day -day basis, how special how precious, how fragile our home is. How small our differences. How common our similarities. By remembering this on a day-to-day -day basis, we can start to make this tiny leap towards working together as one human family. We can start 
to safeguard our home, our hearth. Thank you.